wanted to welcome everybody uh, to the our uh, latest incarnation of the uh, of the BMT Journal Club. Uh, just as a quick way of introduction, this is sort of a an informal, um, organically created uh, effort by uh, Miguel Perales and Bill Wood and myself uh, to try to do something uh, productive with social media uh, and with the tools that are available. And uh, that led to this idea of trying to do a journal club uh, on air. Uh, this is uh, we've had we have about 15 people who've uh, signed up and said that they were going to join us today. Uh, we're international, in fact. We have uh, there's somebody joining us from Italy. There's somebody joining us uh, from Argentina. So this is uh, uh, this is pretty. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled. Um, and of course, New York and New York and North Carolina and down in ta Tampa. Um, and so I want to also so I want to you know, sorry introduce our uh, speaker for our preceptor for today is Sh uh, Shaji Kumar from the Mayo Clinic. He's professor of medicine uh, in the Department of uh, Hematology. His research interests lie in uh, drug development and the bone marrow microenvironment and multiple myeloma. Uh, it turns out fortuitously that he is a co-author of the paper that we're going to uh, present and discuss today. Uh, and so uh, hopefully he knows all about uh, the, sorry, what is it, the left? Uh, truncated. Left, tr <laughs> left truncated analysis, uh, which we struggled for hours with here today. Uh, but so I'm gonna, and then finally, I'm introducing uh, uh, Athena Kritharis, who is a third year fellow second. here. Second okay. year fellow. Oh my gosh, you you're here that. for another. That's right. I'm here for another year. Second year fellow here with us uh, at Tufts, and she's going to present the paper. Uh, and as she does that, we're going to switch over. Uh, to sharing. Let's have do that. Okay, oops, share. Oh, I see you gotta click share. There we go. So that's so you can just fine. do that. So you should still hear us. Um, mm -hmm. and there you go. All right, perfect. So thank you everyone for joining us. So today we'll be uh, going through uh, an article by Vijay et al. and Dr. Kumar, uh, which was uh, recently published in the Biology of Blood and Marrow Transplantation Journal in 2015, entitled The Impact of Pre-Transplant Therapy and Depth of Disease Response Before Autotransplant uh, in mul uh, Multiple Myeloma. So I just wanted to start off with a timeline depicting the history and treatment of multiple myeloma from 1844 to the present. You see that uh, alkylator agents such as melphalan took their place in the treatment in 1950, uh, with more novel agents such as thalidomide, bortezomib, and lenalidomide uh, changing our treatment of multiple myeloma in the last two decades and replacing VAD as induction therapy. The new induction regimens for transplant eligible myeloma have been shown to increase depth of response. Combinations of proteasome inhibitors and imids have also led to unprecedented depths of response, such as um, with lenalidomide and bortezomib of uh, 30 to 40 percent, with overall response rates quoted at 100 percent. Uh, these are in comparison to our older alkylator or anthracycline based treatments where complete responses. Uh, were quoted at 5%. This is a nice figure illustrating uh, the induction regimens and their response in multiple myeloma patients, showing an increased uh, overall response rate, VGPR and CR, with incorporation of new agents. And we see that combinations of imids with proteasome inhibitors, along with dexamethasone, have improved disease response. Additionally, uh, novel induction treatments have improved progression-free and overall survival. Uh, lenalidomide and dexamethasone um, has shown a 92% overall survival at three years. So relevant to this article are uh, two points that come into play, timing and response. So there's various literature on both of these, but studies from uh, Fernand et al. and, and the intergroup trial 9321 showed similar survival whether transplant is done early or delayed. The Spanish group demonstrated that patients with progressive disease to induction therapy have dismal outcomes when taken directly to transplant, 
while depth of the response pre-transplant correlates with post-transplant progression-free survival and in some studies, overall survival. But does this hold true? In a study by Wong et al., they found that CR was an important prognostic factor for longer survival. In a retrospective evaluation of about 800 patients, uh, they looked to assess the impact of CR on survival in multiple myeloma. They found that intensive therapy did not prolong survival with patients, for patients with CR after primary therapy and that median survival for patients with CR uh, was about 9.7 years compared to 4.4 years for PR and 2.7 years uh, with patients with no response. And you see that whether the patient had an ISS of 1, 2, or 3, uh, CR was an important prognostic factor for long survival. This followed by stage 1 disease, PR, and intensive treatment. In a small study, single center study, Kumar et al. found that a lack of response to initial induction therapy did not prevent a good response to transplant. At one year, relapse-free and overall survival were not significantly different between the two groups. After accounting for all variables in a multivariate analysis, they also found that plasma cell labeling index, CR, cytogenetics, M protein and circulating plasma cells at harvest were significant variables. So this brings us to our article. Does additional chemotherapy to improve induction response pre-transplant improve outcomes post-transplant? So the study was performed uh, looking at uh, uh, the CIBMTR, a retrospective database analysis from 1995 to 2010 um, involving 80 centers. Endpoints included uh, response rate, progression-free survival, and overall survival. They included those patients that had a suboptimal response, uh, which was defined as less than a PR to first-line chemotherapy. They excluded those patients that had a CR, PR, or had missing information. So of the 539 patients that failed to achieve at least a PR, they were then analyzed in two separate in cohorts, uh, salvage versus no salvage therapy. Uh, with the group uh, that received salvage therapy, about 76% had one additional line of therapy, 20% uh, for two lines, and 4% for more than two lines. The statistics um, included a Mann Whitney Wilcoxon test, chi square test, Fisher's exact test. Response and progression um, was uh, uh, based on the International Myeloma Working Group criteria, Kaplan Meyer survive for survival, two sided tests with a significance of 0.05, Cox proportional hazards models with time dependent covariates to show treatment effects in different time periods, and a left truncated multivariate analysis. Um, and then the basis of this analysis was to reduce the potential waiting time bias. So instead of starting at time of induction treatment or at time of transplant, analyses started at diagnosis. Patient characteristics. In both groups, they were well matched for age, gender, performance status, immunoglobulin, and disease stage. Uh, they were uh, slightly different um, as far as serum creatinine. Uh, which was greater than 1.5 and 27% of the patients in the salvage group versus 17% in the no salvage group. Um, majority received uh, uh, steroid-based therapies um, with uh, about 50% um, in the salvage group receiving VAD first line, while there were about 40% of patients that received more novel agents. Uh, the majority of the patients were in PR going into transplant, and the median follow-up of survivors was 61 and 68 months. Related mortality, progression, PFS, and overall survival, whether uh, with salvage or without salvage, were not significant at four years. And, um, and you'll see the numbers below. There was also no difference in overall survival for salvage with novel agents. The uh, curves on the left uh, show an effect of salvage on survival in those patients 
um, who did not respond to bortezomib, thalidomide, or lenalidomide. Well, on the right, the effect of salvage in patients receiving bortezomib and or lenalidomide in first-line therapy. Overall survival for CRPR patients after salvage was no better than no salvage. Uh, the overall survival of patients who attain CRPR after salvage compared to no salvage is seen um, in figure A where uh, uh, overall survival was 68 months versus 62 months in um, the group and this was not statistically significant. On the right, um, you'll see uh, overall survival of patients with CRPR compared to those who did not have a response to salvage. And here are 68 months versus 48 months um, in that group, and so it was better than no response. In a multivariate analysis, uh, a creatinine of greater um, uh, than 1.5 was predictive of transplant-related mortality and overall survival. And so our overall conclusions are that, from this study, are that achieving less than a PR after one line of initial induction had inferior survival. Additional salvage therapy pre-transplant improved the depth of the response, but it was not significant as far as overall survival and progression-free survival when compared to patients who did not receive salvage. Salvage therapy did not improve results in the 39% of patients receiving modern therapy, and a median overall survival was superior if CRPR was attained after salvage as opposed to no response, but again, it was no better than no salvage. So a critique of the study, it was limited by those poor outcome patients, um, those patients who received salvage but did not make it to the transplant. Uh, there was no listing of cytogenetics, which as we know from um, uh, current International Myeloma Working Group are, are relevant to risk stratification. And uh, there was a lack of uniform induction and salvage regimen uh, number of cycles. Uh, in the study as well, um, in the latter half of the study, there were more newer agents that were being used and post-transplant uh, maintenance likely came into play. So questions for discussion. One, how many cycles of induction therapy should we administer? Two, is the failure to respond to induction therapy prognostic or a volume of disease issue that can be overcome with alternative treatment regimens? Three, what is the optimal induction regimen? Should we be using three drug therapy up front? And what should we be doing with our novel agents? As it, uh, was shown in this study, um, there was a uh, lack of improvement in using uh, the newer agents. And four, is it possible that continuing chronic therapy in resistant disease selects for an even more resistant disease? So let's see, I'm going to, uh, we're going to stop here. Good. All right, here we are, back <laughs> live. So let's put it uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Dr. Kumar then to uh, how about just a first a, a little bit of maybe a history of this study and, and the motivation behind it and then, then what the, how, let's let's talk a bit about what the conclusions we can draw from this yeah no uh, so that is really nicely presented so the reason why we ended up doing this study was again I think it's a very common problem we face in the clinic and we often get these referrals from um, from oncologists who, you know, who either you know the patient is not responding to primary therapy, um, what do we do next? Or you see instances where patients have been have not been taken to transplant because they did not have a good response to primary therapy and they did not respond well to salvage therapy. So I think a lot of those come from again from the lymphoma uh, scenario where you know. Uh, response to salvage therapy is critical in terms of um, transplant eligibility. So there has been the past multiple you know, studies showing different results, but in general, um, at least before the novel agents came along, the feeling was that if somebody did not respond to the primary therapy, which again mostly was steroid-based or alkylator-based, um, sorry, um, steroid-based or uh, anthracycline-based, you know, high-dose therapy with nulfilan seemed to overcome those um, those issues. 
Now, when we look at the new uh, drugs, one, the proportion of patients with primary refractory disease has significantly dropped uh, with the new agents. And the question was, does this paradigm still hold true? And obviously, the ideal way to do this study would be to take a cohort of patients at diagnosis and follow them um, and see who is refractory and who is not and see what what proportion got salvage therapy. But uh, the best database that we can kind of get our hands on is probably the CABMDR database to at least try and answer this question. Um, but the problem as already highlighted with the CABMDR database is that the transplant had to have happened for those patients to figure in the database. So we are obviously missing out on a whole chunk of patients who either the physicians decided they don't want to do any salvage therapy or decided to do something else or had salvage therapy and did not respond well and automatically was assumed that this patient is not going to do well with transplant and so never actually go to a transplant center or patients who actually got a salvage therapy and could have died from complications of the salvage therapy. So there's a lot of patients who are missing from this analysis um, but one thing you could argue is all those patients are probably the ones with even poorer prognosis, so they wouldn't have necessarily changed the overall interpretation of the study. Um, you know, again, that is um, hypothesis or speculation at this point because we just don't have access to that um, population. So I think this is about as close as we can get to the data we have in hand, short of a prospectively designed study to answer the question of whether salvage therapy would be of benefit in patients who appear to be primary refractory. So, um, so I think with all the shortcomings, I think it still is a valuable addition to, um, to the data um, that we can use for guiding uh, the treatment choices for these patients. Um, but I think, again, I think, you know, the, what does add to the strength of the study is it does have a sizable proportion of patients who are receiving the current therapies. So clearly, I think the results are still quite valid in the current era. Clearly, again, you know, as was pointed out, we don't have the cytogenetics um, and all those other factors which we know are uh, significant from a prognostic standpoint. But I, again, as I said, I think it's still it's a valuable set of uh, information that we can use. And could you touch on a little bit of the uh, left truncated multivariate uh, analysis <laughs> for us? <laughs> I, think, I think we let it get the CABM just statisticians online for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I think the, the whole thing was just to kind of um, try and correct for, again, um, you know, we're looking at every, everybody who had a transplant, so that event's taken place, and then um, what is the outcome um, kind of starting uh, from that time point because everything else before that we really don't have any dimension to it in a way. Um, we just know that okay there's a selected group of people who are refractory and then we kind of looked at the group who actually got salvage therapy and then came to transplants. You kind of as already mentioned lost a whole bunch of people along the way. So I think the, the is, again I don't know the, the all the the finer details of the methodology, but the whole goal was to kind of take into account those losses and see if we can correct for them to some extent. So take, in the context then of, uh, of uh, the results of this study, what, what, are you, what do you see now as the, what is the role of induction therapy prior to autologous transplant? And then what becomes the ideal uh, regimen to use, or, or how, how does the, would this inform choices in terms of sequencing? So the way I look at it, I think you know the whole thing is a package deal. Let's just take a look at the whole transplant eligible patient population. So it's a it's a package of therapy that you're going to give over a period of time, maybe a couple of years. So it in, includes the induction, the transplant, one or two of them, maybe some post transplant consolidation, and maybe some element of maintenance. Now, obviously, not every patient with myeloma needs everything, so that is the part I think we are trying to get to is some kind of stratification as to what is the duration and the intensity of therapy patients need. So I think one thing I think most people agree on is that if you have high-risk disease, there's the risk of early development of resistance is high, and those patients clearly need intense therapy, prolonged therapy to try and eradicate as much of the clone as possible. On the other extreme, you have patients who have long you know, history of muggers who are real, relatively indolent in terms of their 
clinical behavior where you whatever you do you are not going to eradicate the clone so right. you want to try and give them a reasonable amount of therapy that will control the disease and, and keep get, get them Hang on for a moment. Um, Saji, I'm sorry. It's good. good. We're losing. So, uh, whoops, I think we lost the last 10, 30 seconds that you said. Oh, okay. So no, I, what I was saying was the, the patients would tend to have this interline type of behavior. You know, however hard you try, you are not going to get them into a complete response. So I think those patients we really need to be cognizant of what toxicity we might be inflicting by trying to give very intense therapy for those patients. But going back to the injection, you know, the duration of injection is really um, there is no real scientific data as to what is the ideal duration of injection therapy. Um, I think originally, at least from a historic perspective, the reason why we kind of went away with the four cycles um, was, you know, that was a reasonable amount of time that that um, you know, to, to get the patient into a reasonable good disease control, get the necessary uh, approvals, at least in the, in the U.S. setting, and also um, kind of getting all the logistics in place for getting a transplant. So um, I think whether it's four, six, eight, I think... At the end of the day, what we are hoping to achieve with that initial therapy is reversing the complications, getting a reasonable control of the disease, and getting the patient into a shape good enough that they can actually go to a stem. Prolonging the injection therapy, I don't think really makes much of a difference. If you're not getting to a the degree of response that you desire, so to speak, with your induction therapy, you still have the opportunity to gain that during your transplant, whether it's single or tandem. If that is still not sufficient, you still have an opportunity to go in with your consolidation post-transplant. And then there is the maintenance opportunity as well. So I think it all is driven by what, is, what do you want at the end of that package for this part, for a particular for a given patient? Again, based on various characteristics, most um, obviously the um, high-risk cytogenetics. So I think we have the opportunity to kind of tailor each of the segments um, um, to kind of get to where we want. I get another question that we had was uh, when is the correct timing of giving the novel agents given that there was no difference in overall survival for salvage with novel agents is it something that we could maybe hold off to until after transplant or right so I think so two reasons one is when you look at the the reason I think we always have to use the novel agent the injection therapy comes from a part of this myeloma uh, population that we don't typically see in the phase three trials. That is the early mortality. If you look at the CR database, um, before the novel agents came along, there was about 20% one year mortality in these patients with myeloma. Um, the, if you look at the data from the, past, the more recent years, it's dropped down to about maybe 12 or 11%, but still substantially high. And the problem is all these phase three trials that we look at don't actually reflect these patients because they don't really show up in any of those trials. But even if you look at the phase three trials, for example, when we had the high dose flex and the persona set control arm, we still had about 10% early mortality. And if you look at the lenalidomide low dose or any of the novel agent infection therapies, um, then we see the, the early mortality is down to maybe 0.5 in that selective group of patients. And I think the biggest change that's happened is in novel agent. So I think incorporation of an effective therapy, aka novel agent, is absolutely necessary for the initial therapy. So that is going to enable you to get that patient to the transplant if that is the intention. Okay. Just checking the, checking the Twitterverse. <laughs> we, out we, there. we had one question. <laughs> hey, all right, please. Hang on. There we go. Uh, so if the if the depth of response we're seeing based on all of this isn't really changing the outcome, what sort of scenario would you see where we would still use like VDT pace or something like that up front, you know, um, as either pre-transplant or somewhere else in the in the where would we just not use that at all anymore? No, I think it's an important question. I think that brings up the the part this paper doesn't really talk about, which is we talk about everybody who has less than a PR. 
but buried in there are people who actually have progressive disease. And we know those patients don't do very well, um, irrespective of whatever we do for those patients. But at the same time, if you have progressive disease, it's very difficult to collect stem cells and actually do a transplant for those patients, more from a practical standpoint. Whether, um, I think those group of patients, you know, it's very difficult to dissect out the outcomes of those patients from within this um, data set. But from, it, um, from what we see in the clinic, I think those are the patients, ones with very aggressive disease, primary progressive disease, plasma cell leukemias. Those patients really need high, very intense um, initial therapy, and those are the patients I would definitely consider using VDT based uh, type of regimens for a cycle or two, and maybe even collect some of them on the rebound and then take them just stem cell transplant. All right, how do we, do we have? Um, oh, sorry. So do you, do you think that the, is there, let's see, uh, does your, the, the choice of the, I, I suppose one, one question that I have uh, in thinking about how I'm going to induce patients is, you know, do I really need to use all of my available drugs or should I uh, save them and it, or save, uh, if I'm going to use Revlimid for maintenance, should I use a bortezomib based uh, induction regimen and save that uh, for after the transplant since it does, the depth of response prior to transplant doesn't matter. Granted, uh, you know, it's, uh, you, you certainly highlighted the importance of disease control. Uh, but I wonder too, if you're giving all of the, if you're giving all of the available drugs or the, the three, you know, the classes of drugs ahead, at the beginning, do you sacrifice some um, effectiveness later on down the road? No, I think, I think, it's, I think it's an important question because, you know, that's the debate that, you know, it keeps going on, never stops, right? So it's one versus two versus three versus four versus now maybe with the monoclonal antibody it's five. Um, but the, um, I think again kind of goes back to what your eventual goal for a given patient is. If your eventual goal is that somebody has high risk disease and you really badly need this person to get to a ER or an MRD negative disease state, I would say we want to start right away with that, with that purpose in mind and use the combinations like we or any of those trials. But if you if you think the eventual depth of response, whether it's a CR or a stringent CR or MRD negative state, is not going to be of that much importance, aka standard risk disease, then I am not in a hurry to get to that point. And then I am comfortable using a um, single drug combination uh, or, um, you know, it's something like Lendex or uh, Bortosmib, Cytoxantex combinations. Um, and that is... Um, and I think that's the way I would look at it. Um, you know, if we think about it as risk stratification, but again, I think the risk stratification is indirectly based on what is our eventual goal for a given patient. Yeah. I mean, you could argue that if uh, patients with um, high risk disease does better with CR versus no CR, shouldn't the same thing hold true for uh, the standard risk patients too? But unfortunately, from based on what we know so far, that doesn't seem to be true. Because if you look at the Arkansas data, the GEP standard risk patients didn't really make a difference whether they go to the CR or not, whereas the high-risk GEP signature folks actually did much better with the CR versus no CR. Now, it's always hard to tease apart what is biology and what is therapy, um, but I think given all that caveats, I think still the high-risk patients, our goal should be as much of eradication of the disease as possible. Again, you could hypothesize, you know, again, based on all the clonal evolution data, maybe leaving even a small clone behind in a highly um, genomically unstable high-risk disease is a bad thing to do. And maybe some of the effect that we see is coming from that. So um, one of the things you noted in your multivariate analysis was that increased creatinine, so creatinine greater than 1.5 at the time of diagnosis, correlated with increased transport, uh, transplant related mortality as well as decreased overall survival. So two questions in regards to that. Did you, were you surprised that uh, the PFS was not significant in that regard? And also how does this compare to other data in regards to the, tra uh, the creatinine level at the time of, um, at the time of diagnosis and progression-free survival and overall survival? So like two-part questions. Right. 
So I think um, you know the real dysfunction at the time of diagnosis we know from multiple trials is uh, very prognostic. Patients who present with renal failure always do worse. Mm -hmm. Now some of it's clearly biology because many of these patients who present with renal failure obviously have very high light chain levels. And we know that the patients, if you take the group of patients with high light chain levels, they are enriched in translocations and more likely to have 414s and 1416s. So, so it may not necessarily be the renal failure that entirely drives the poor prognosis. That's probably the cause of high-risk genetic abnormalities as well. Um, we also know that if you correct the renal function back to normal, they do better than the ones who don't get a correction but still don't quite catch up with the people who had a normal renal function at baseline. Now, once you look at the transplant patient population, we know that if you take patients with renal compromise and dose just the melphalan and give them transplant, their outcomes, at least in the, you know, the single institution and the CABMTS studies, has been very similar, both in terms of PFS and overall survival. But again, it has the same issue of you know how many of those patients diagnosed with renal insufficiency actually got referred and actually go to a stem cell transplant. And again, selecting out a group of people from within the, the poor renal function um, that is, again, better off than the rest of the group. So I think once you can get to a transplant and you can get a relatively equal in dose of melphalan even after the correction, you tend to do better because now you have kind of homogenized that group. Thank you. All right. Did you have something? <laughs> oh, okay. Hang on. We're going back to our. Uh, so I guess do you do you um, do you see anything on the horizon that you think may change this paradigm, or uh, do you think what what do you think that, for example, the impact of the monoclonals could be in this setting? Right. So the, I think that the biggest question is going to be asked. We have more and more drugs coming along. Can you know the question that's going to keep getting asked is can we get to that goal of MRD negativity or CR stringent CR without actually having hydrosmel plan in there? And um, I don't know if you're going to get there, um, but uh, we certainly have a lot of new drugs with different mechanisms of action. So that is definitely a question that that's that's going to be relevant. And in fact, is currently being asked in the phase three trial, the IFM uh, DFCI trial, where they are looking at a early versus delayed transplant, aka a transplant at first relapse. Now, obviously, you could argue if that trial didn't show, um, I mean, showed an advantage for an early transplant, you know. Three years later, we're going to ask the same question again. What if we added the antibody in the beginning? Would that have eliminated the need for the stem cell transplants? I don't think the question is going to ever go away. Um, but um, but I think until we can find something that's, you know, quote unquote, cure for the disease, I don't think hydrose therapy is going to go away. It may not necessarily be part of the first line package. It could become a part of the second line package. But still, I think it's going to be there. Uh, and uh, just uh, to include Miguel in the conversation, what what do you see now as the role of allogeneic transplant in um, in upfront or in relapse setting in this relapse setting? No. Oh, did I click on you? Oh, there you go. Did you hear? I'm sorry. So, what do you think about the, what what would be the role of allogeneic transplant now in 2015? Yeah. I was asking Shaji. Oh. Sorry, Dr. Kumar. Oh, okay. So oh, sorry. I thought you were asking Miguel about the question. Okay. Well, I can ask Miguel too, but he didn't seem. All right. So now I'm asking Miguel. What do you think? <laughs> I got Miguel is uh, on the spot. We'll start here. I'm trying to tweet at the same time. <laughs> I'm still on the last question. <laughs> I mean, I think you know. Obviously, the the CTN is still asking the question of. Um, what the role of valid transplant may be in myeloma, and I think that for selected patients, it's still a approach that should at least be investigated. I don't think, similar, you know, similar to the fact that high dose therapy is not going away, I think we, we still need to uh, ask and answer the question of is there a role for allo transplant and, and how we may approach that, and, and certainly in what patients we should select for that, uh, that approach. Yeah, I think you know. Again, I think the allogeneic transplants again going to be here to, to stay at least for the foreseeable future. We still have all these young patients who don't do well with all the treatments we have, and 
the key I think is to try and identify who benefits from it the most and try and do it early on rather than waiting for everything else to fail. And then you are really, you know, you've got a biologically extremely aggressive disease and I don't think allogenic transplant can call things down at that point. Anybody, uh, let's see, so uh, any other questions to pose to our, uh, to our preceptor? Uh, if not, then we'll end a little bit uh, on the early side. Um, but thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kumar, for joining us tonight uh, on, uh, at the very, very last moment. And I'm glad we were able to, to uh, pull this off. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time. All right. Yeah, this, is, this is a nice, nice neat thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and you. Uh, thank you to everybody who joined us, to everybody who's uh, online. Um, and uh, we look forward to another uh, one of these events in about uh, three months, probably the first week or first two weeks in June. Uh, check back and uh, watch for uh, email and uh, Twitter. Please feel free to share uh, your uh, feedback with us. I'm gonna, I'll send out an email tomorrow or the next day. Uh, particularly around uh, the sort of connectivity kinds of uh, issues. I'm still learning a lot about how to make this all hang together. Uh, and uh, just again, thank you very much for joining us tonight and look forward to seeing you guys again.